Okay, hello all. Um, it's great to have a chance to speak at this event. This is a great event, and I'd like to thank all who, who make it happen. Um, today I'm going to talk about <clears throat> uh, using drones or UAVs uh, and photogrammetry methods to create large point, point, cl point cloud scenes. Uh, to do that, I'm going to first talk a little bit about photogrammetry and then how we extract three-dimensional information, little overview of drone technology uh, that makes them suitable for this work, and some operational considerations, and then we'll look at some examples. So first, why would we want to do this? Well, <clears throat> a, a good point cloud scene could be great for pre-visualization work, uh, perhaps for set extension work, maybe, you know, and obviously, you know, content for VR, AR, or, or gaming applications. Um, I want to make, last year at HPA, uh, <clears throat> Jay-Z and an, a gentleman from Unity did a really interesting presentation using uh, the Unity game development environment in which they orchestrated an actor and, and camera and, and some scenes. So uh, this could be, a, you, you could use uh, Unity and, and you know, generate a, a scene or a building um, with these techniques. And then you could actually start orchestrating and, and planning, uh, planning, planning your production. <clears throat> So first of all, mapping in, in the remote sensing industry is really quite mature, so, but UAVs are, are bringing new capability to this pre-existing art that we can start taking advantage of. Okay, so first of all, uh, photogrammetry is the science of making measurements from photographs, and we've been doing it as long as we've been doing aerial photography. <clears throat> it's basically the creation of maps from, pho pho from photographs. So here's some, some terms that y you'll hear in, in, this, in, in this term, in this art. An orthophotograph or an ortho image is uh, geometrically corrected. It's, it's geometrically corrected for the lens and also because it, it might be uh, procured from an ob oblique angle, uh, 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 not, not perpendicular or nadir. An ortho mosaic is a composite of, of ortho photographs, uh, of, of corrected photographs. And then a georeferenced ortho mosaic is calibrated and, and aligned uh, with, with latitude and longitude. So, so basically, it's, it's a map. <clears throat> so how did, you do, how did you do an ortho photograph in, in the early days of photographs? So here's a picture of a rectifying enlarger. Basically, you, you could alter the table or the lens to, to compensate for the geometric distortions uh, from the from the source photograph, uh, if it was taken at, a, at an oblique angel, ang angle, <clears throat> so before we had the ability to transform. <clears throat> so here's a, a simple. I just did a, a simple flyover uh, of a of a, a little hill, and um, it, it, here are the source photographs. Again, they're digitally processed. You know, now that we're in the digital age, they're they're. Uh, uh, Orthorectified and then, and then merged. All right, but that's great. So we can make a map, a two-dimensional uh, map from aerial photographs. But how did how do we start making three-dimensional maps? Um, so here's a device called a, a stereo plotter, the kind of next step in the in the evolution. And this required an operator to, you know, with with a pair of photographs, move a puck around and converge two dots, and in doing so, they could trace a line at a given depth value, and then and they could, they could create a, a contour map. So it, it's basic, you know, it's basic uh, a crude, you know, inverse stereographic projection. <clears throat> okay, so we're able to take a pair of photographs and do that with optical analysis, but, you know, now that we're in the digital age, um, one of the, a, a common mapping product is called a, a digital surface model. <clears throat> so this is created algorithmically from a series of photographs um, and generally it's provided as a, uh, a colored TIFF. Um, you know, also you, 
you know, you're probably aware that, um, you know, L LIDAR and, and another technology, uh, IFSAR and INSAR, they, they create depth information that way by uh, flying, flying over. And, and you can actually buy, or even in, in the public domain, you can buy digital surface models or, or get free di digital surface models from your you know, municipality. And actually, these can be handy when you're about to go on a, a flying mission because you know uh, what, you're going to be f what you're going to be flying over. All right, this is, um, again, that same sample of, uh, that I, of, from the ortho mosaic, uh, and this is the corresponding DSM uh, map product. <clears throat> and here's a, here's a, a, a crude three-dimensional model from that same, same platform. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we're in the digital age. Uh, the, the remote sensing industry is, is huge, uh, and there's been lots of advantages. Uh, and right now, there's many new program, uh, photogrammetry applications and, and platforms. And we're, what we're seeing as we start to push the envelope of uh, density of, of depth information, uh, we see that photogrammetry and 3D capture are, are kind of at, a, at an intersection. <clears throat> so what's, what's new is that uh, UAVs can leverage this art and bring all this to low altitude acquisition. <clears throat> So we, we've talked about, you know, in the early days extracting depth Im image from a pair of images, depth information. But now what we do is we process a whole series of, of images. W what the software will do is examine uh, readily identifiable characteristics or features within each image, and then it will correlate those features across as many uh, images that have that feature in common. And in, in some high-end uh, software, you, you might be doing this, uh, you might be identifying thousands of, of features in, in each image. And then we uh, you know, al al algorithmically extract the depth information, you know, not unlike what was done with the, with the optical plot, plotter. <clears throat> so if, if now you're creating some granular uh, three-dimensional data, it's actually better uh, to, you, you, you can create the better mapping products. Um, like the, or we'll, we'll see some more ex examples shortly. The ortho mosaic doesn't have to be uh, a bunch of stitched photos, the ortho, ortho mosaic can be a top-down uh, rendering of the point cloud. <clears throat> All right, quickly a little bit about UAVs. Um, as we know, FAA nomenclature, unmanned aerial systems is the terminology that they use the most that pretty much refers to the entire, the entire kit. Um, un unmanned aerial vehicle is is the term for the aircraft, anything from a half a pound to 50 pound, 55 pounds is, is in this uh, domain. And I think we all have seen the impact that drones have had on productions. I mean, you see shots across all genres. It's, a, it's becoming a common production aesthetic. <clears throat> so why did dr drones take off so quickly um, uh, and, and so economically? Low-cost GPSs, low-cost accelerometers, uh, better battery technology, and, 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 and why did that become so cost-effective? You know, these things, the phone. I mean, in here is an accelerometer, a magnetometer, a GPS, <clears throat> and uh, lots of battery technology. So the point is, you know, economically driven uh, technology investments you know, become, become enabling technology. This, this is a control stack. Oh, let me, let me just go one more here. So that's the hardware 
Of course, there's the software. Um, and this is core robotic technology software. Feedback theory, digital filtering, sensor fusion, the ability to take input from, you know, say, say GPS al altitude or uh, barometric altitude or information from the accelerometer and the magnetometer. Actually, there's also a magnetometer in your phone. Um, and then f fuse that information together to determine your position. So this is a, I also like racing drones. This is a control stack for, <laughs> for a drone and it's about 30 or $40 and it represents you know, what formerly was, was, you know, depending on how far you go back, but, you know, six figures of military technology and, and, a, and a tiny little thing. So, um, okay. So UAVs are, gonna, are going to enable low cost, uh, low altitude flight with the possibility of achieving a higher ground pixel density, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. <clears throat> now you have many ch choices of camera payloads. Uh, you might have a small integrated camera or uh, a, larger, a larger format camera on, on, a, on a gimbal. But an important aspect when you're doing this work is you're using autonomous flight. And uh, mission planning is, is an important part about autonomous flight. And you know, I, I want to make a po point about autonomous flight, though. It, it, it's um, generally, <laughs> in consumer drones and professional drones, you are flying autonomously. It is closed loop with the GPS. The operator is really just pushing it, or pushing it around unless, unless they've lost uh, GPS contact, in which they do have to fly it themselves and compensate for wind and drift. But for, under most circumstances, um, unless you're a drone racer, <clears throat> you're running closed loop with GPS, and so it is autonomous flight. Now, autonomous flight is, is um, it's legally, you, know, we, you have to maintain visual line of sight, uh, perhaps with a spotter, and you have to be able to readily regain control. So in order to do autonomous flight, you, you use a mission planning application, and there's uh, many min mission planning applications out there with specific f features depending on what you're, what you're trying to do. And, and with that, you define the path of flight. <clears throat> and um, so if you're going to scan a scene or a structure, um, you're also going to want to determine the point of view. If you're just doing mapping of a terrain, you will just do a nadir or a, a orthogonal you know, perpendicular view. <clears throat> if, if you want to have a structure, then you're going to need you're going to need some oblique views as well. And additionally, again, depending on the structure, you may need some ground photography. Okay, so the mission planning application, uh, in, in addition to def defining your flight plan. Also, you're going to define your camera control parameters, your exposure, your focus, uh, and very critical is the amount of desired overlap that you want with your images and uh, how you're going to be controlling the gimbal and, and orient it towards your target. So, but an, an important um, metric that you're going to be working towards is the, the, what's known as the ground pixel density. <clears throat> Um, in, in this, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure this is some, everyone in this audience understands this notion. Basically, if you know the size of your imager and the, and the number of elements in the imager and you know your focal length and you know your height, you know your, your, what you, you know the dimensions of a sample on the ground. So that, that that determines the density of your information, and then as you're, you know, processing those pictures and making products from that, um, uh, it also drives the density of the resulting, resulting products. So the point is, you will be, as you're doing your mission mission planning and determining your altitude and your optical system, you're going to be working towards uh, a, a desired 
ground sample density. <clears throat> but there's other things. Um, you're going to want a large depth of field because if you're flying over the ground and you have a rooftop or tree tops, you, 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 you need to have uh, everything in focus because this is how the depth information is going to be extracted from the, the com compared view uh, of these images. And I, of course, you have, you have competing parameters. You also want it to be fast enough, a shutter speed, because you're on a platform that uh, perhaps has vibration or, or, or motion. Um, I mean, you, you can construct a mission to, to stop at every waypoint, but even then, it has to stop and stabilize. And that also kind of doubles the amount of time uh, that you have uh, mission-wise and battery-wise. Also, it's very good to uh, have uh, have overcast light if you're making a three-dimensional model. Otherwise, your shadows get burned into the model. <clears throat> okay, so GPS tagging. If you have a if you have a drone that has an integrated ca camera, it's very it it again, remember the GPS is part of the control system, and if the camera is well integrated, when it takes a picture, the GPS co coordinates are embedded in the EXIF data, met metadata of the image. But you do need to, you know, scrutinize some of the, that data. Uh, different manufacturers do different things. Uh, um, some popular drone manufacturers take, just take the raw GPS data and, and put that in the uh, EXIF data, which I guess you can rationalize on some level, but they don't, they don't take the fused data from the altimeter. And the altimeter, in, I mean, the barometric altimeter is going to provide much more precise altitude data than GPS altitude data. It's, it's both, uh, both noisy and, and not, not always accurate. If you have a non-integrated camera that you're only you're just giving it commands to shoot, then what you do after the fact is you harvest the log data from the controller and the GPS, and um, either insert that into the EXIF data or you use an application that it's aware. Men, most of the uh, image mapping processing platforms just like to look at the EXIF data. <clears throat> Uh, also, there's some interesting new GPS uh, correction technologies on the market. You may have heard of the terms uh, RTK or, or, or PPK. Um, without d uh, diving into it, basically, you, you will, it requires an extra ground-based GPS station, um, which is being used to characterize the noise, and then by using this sort of a system, you can get, um, you know, like millimeter level positioning accuracy from the GPS. So this is something that's really interesting to, well, it's commonly used in the surveying industry, and now we're putting um, RTK-capable GPS systems in, in, in drones, so especially drones being used for su survey and mapping work. <clears throat> Oh, another very uh, important uh, practice is, is using uh, what's known as ground control points. What you do is you place visual targets of known precise location in, in the area that you're mapping. Um, and, you know, for a number of reasons. One, if you're, if you're going to be making a map, obviously, uh, it becomes a reference point for, for the geolocation uh, of, of that map. But there's other uh, very useful functions. If you, if you are using multiple systems or you're going back on multiple days, uh, it, it's, it's good to have, uh, to be able to have your ground target show up in, a, in at least one of each set of those uh, sets of images to to pull them together, I've, they're, they're ex extremely useful. <clears throat> okay, so here's 
I was, I've been evaluating a, a many different packages uh, to find out what their capabilities are. And this uh, was some work uh, in a, over, a, actually it was a ground-based drone mission of a stream in Alaska. But while I was there, I, I created a, a mission to fly along the, the side. Now, I'm not really blanketing this stream with photographs. It's really just two passes. So there, there's lots of overlap along the paths, but there's really only two sets of images along here. And again, uh, my ground sample density was really pretty, pretty high. I mean, I mean, it was a large number. It wasn't a, 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 a small uh, image. So it, it's, it, it's just a, a moderate amount of, 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 of precision. Um, so I, I was at 400 feet, uh, a, a consumer size imager, ba basically, with, with, with good overlap only in, in one direction. <clears throat> so this, um, this made a, a huge detailed uh, point cloud that I was pleased to pleased with. This is, this is only a, a colored point cloud at this point. It's not, it, the vertices aren't filled in. Um, and, and again, remember, this is just top-down imagery, only two passes. So if, if you're way oblique, if you're way off axis, um, you know, you will see uh, occlusions or, 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 or gaps. But it's a big model. It's 260 million vertices or triangles. <clears throat> Let me see if I can take a look at a, a piece of it here. All right, there's it stops moving when I do that. Well, let's look at this. This so so this is the ortho mosaic that's created from uh, this. And again, is like I said before, instead of gluing a bunch of photo, uh, ortho rectified photographs together, you're taking the point cloud and you're rendering it from infinity. Um, what, what's the difference, you might ask? Well, you've probably seen, like in Google Maps, where you have a, a building tipping this way, and across the street there's a building tipping that way, and and that's because uh, you've got parallax, you've got you know parallax, it, you have errors at the edge of the photograph, um, and when you try and merge these together, you know you can you can flatten the photograph, you can you can ortho rectify it, but you're still going to have um, the, the, those, those, those distortions. But if you're analyzing all the photographs and creating depth information, now you can create a really, really good ortho mosaic. And, and, and basically the point is you can generate all of the mapping products that you would normally pre create if you've created a very, very dense uh, point cloud from, from, the, from the flyover. And, and yeah, so the size of this is 32 by 29K. <clears throat> All right, so here's a, a single frame rain, render. It's textured and colored. It's not, not just the point clouds. And it's all, this is this, the same set. And it is a, an oblique view. <clears throat> and you see, it, 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 it looks rather, rather natural. Here's, uh, here's one of the source photographs. And let's see if I can point out some features here. So here's a scraggly tree. Uh, here and then you'll see this is this is the source image of that of that tree and, and and again I did one pass on one side and another pass on the other side of this small stream and here is again um, another source photograph versus the the textured um, colored rendering <clears throat> and there there's the tree and and, uh, and let me see if I can also try this tool to blow things up a little bit. There we go. And in, in the model, of course, there's, there's holes in the water. Water is really tricky because it reflects the sky and it thinks that there's more Z depth, which is, which is uh, crazy. Okay. Ne next, next, next project was uh, a historic lighthouse. And these are some representations of the uh, the mission planner. First, we we did a pass at 150 feet, uh, both top down and 
uh, some obl oblique views, and then we decided we needed to go lower, and we did a, another pass at, at 95 and a lower set of obliques. <clears throat> Uh, and here's kind of what we ended, ended up doing. And the, the, these are the calculated locations of, of the photographs. You'll see the 150-foot the the layer, the 90-foot layer, the 51-foot layer. And then, and then uh, like I said, we, we did a lot of ground. Because of the nature of this building, it was uh, really important to, to do ground photography, and, and we'll see why. So we have a high amount of overlap, which is, which is good, which, which allows for a good depth extraction. <clears throat> and uh, it was uh, 319 images, and like I said, with, with a, a bit of ground photography. So the resulting, uh, the resulting model was, was uh, 53 million triangles. Now, you can... Uh, sparsify it. You know, again, another point is you have to determine what and how you're going to use the model and what the capabilities of your rendering platform are because the, you can generate some extremely large models and you may have to sparsify them down to get the performance in, in the rendering that you need. But in the first pass of this, it, w it was uh, 53 million triangles um, and we had a lot of challenges. Uh, Whenever I would get in the car to go there, it was cloudy, but when I arrived, it was wonderfully sunny, and so I have, I have uh, baked in shadows, you'll see, uh, and I'll have, I have dark areas, but, uh, but th that's, that's the result. Now let's look at some renderings here. So this is, a, uh, again, a source photograph from the ground photography on the right and uh, a kind of a corresponding rendering of, of the cloud on the left. Sorry, but uh, we are over time. <laughs> okay, well, I'll... My fault, I should have come up earlier. Okay, I'll uh, um, be a Sorry, panel. but we can't do any more. Uh, panel, come on up. I'll be, doing I'll be doing breakfast tomorrow morning, if anybody else wants to talk.